I welcome the participants of the conference. I will keep my presentation as previously mentioned together with Adam, with Dr. Adam Priestley. I am um, Tomás Okay. I will keep my presentation with Dr. Adam Priestley. My name is Tomás Jármai and I am the head of the first pre allocation unit at the National Tax and Customs Administration in Fort Rabuizantian County. I have chosen three mottos for our presentation. One of it is from Albert Einstein. The hardest thing is the word, the word to understand is the income tax. But the fraudster always knows the weak point, where to find the weakness of the tax legislation. The other motto is from John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Decrease the tax rate can increase the tax revenue, but that means also that there is fraud in the tax system as well. And the funniest one motto was from Will Russell that the difference between death and taxes is uh, that death doesn't get worse every time Congress meets. I would like to continue. Uh, you can hear me, I hope. Uh, the hardest thing is. Uh, the word to understand is this income tax. That was the motto from Albert Einstein, but the fraudster always know the weak points of the tax system. The other motto, one of my other motto was from John Fitzgerald Kennedy, that the decrease the tax rate can increase the tax revenue. It, is, it can be possible if there is fraud in the tax system. And the funniest motto was the last one. The difference between death and taxes is death doesn't get worse every time Congress meets. That means death never changes, but the tax always, the tax rate always changes. The structure of the National Tax and Customs Administration or administration consists of three main fields of specialization, tax, customs, and financial, in financial investigation. But the tax and customs field of uh, I only identify the suspicious business activities and make their obligation. That means they make their punitive mark or the criminal report for the financial investigation. They work independently under the supervision of the prosecutor's office. It is an obligation for us if we find the suspicion of crime to make or mark to the investigative authority uh, who can decide to initiate the investigation or reject it. Confidential tax information may be given for the investigative authority, but not for media or other places. That means during the tax procedure, it is absolutely not characteristic that the taxpayer makes a confession, but the contrary of this, almost every attorney suggests in every, almost every uh, case, that refuse everything is good for them. But we have a new legal institution since 2018, the contingent tax penalty. That means if you pay 50% of the imposed fine, then the tax that you took uh, must be uh, paid in a short time, then you don't have to pay such much sum of fine. Only during the financial investigations or the judicial proceedings is worthwhile to confess because the penalty can be lowered unrestrictedly. What kind of criminal acts were detected in my county? Budget fraud and forging public and private documents. These were the two largest parts of our identified criminal acts in 2019 and in 2020. The budget, the budget fraud almost the same, and then a little bit less for in public or private documents. And if we choose to see the National Tax and Customs Administration and four, the budget fraud is almost the same rate, but the other criminal acts are much more divided. In 2019 and in 2020, the rate of the budget code is a little bit more. We make, as I mentioned previously, punitive marks as well. In 2019, 
made in both of the Mozambique and County 87 cases, 87 criminal uh, cases. That means five fictitious building, two tax evading, one illegal tobacco trade, one tender fraud, one temporary employment fraud, and 77 was uh, the fraud in electric public road transportation control system. In 2020, there were only 57 cases, and with the large rate of the ECR with electric public road transportation control system. And in 2021, there were only 10 cases because the legislation in the electronic public road transportation control system has been changed. The summary of criminal acts made by the National Tax and Customs Administration in 2019 there were 1,447 indictments and 1,184 abolishments. The budget fraud was 242 million euro, and the property insurance was 252 million euro. In 2020, there were 1,390 indictments and 1,284 abolishments. The budget fraud was a little bit less. 204 million euro, but the property insurance was 277 million euro. And that was my part of this presentation. And I, and the word is yours, Adam. Thank you very much. So thanks for the invitation uh, on behalf of the prosecution service. My name is Adam Petri. I'm working in uh, the Prosecutor General's Office in the AMRC FT department that is mostly all dealing with economic crimes and money laundering, uh, international cooperation and so. Now I have a really, really limited time frame, so I'll need to keep it really short and just to focus on the very brief things and the outcomes of uh, what I want to say is consensual elements and some consensual well room for uh, proceeding in the criminal tax procedures for tax fraud now we have on one hand a very wide range of different legal um, institutions or tools that we can we can use in these procedures uh, you see a very short list here and i will just very briefly give you uh, uh, some overview on uh, which is which and which is used for what kind of uh, purpose, what is the consequence of using uh, these tools. Now, out of the list, possibly uh, the which is mostly in the focus is, of course, the uh, bargain, which is called the settlement or could be as well called as argument or reaching an argument between prosecution service and the defendant. But we ha also have some other legal possibilities. One, the first, compensating financial loss, and I will give you some really brief explanation on these. So very first, the compensation is, of course, paying back the financial loss that is caused by the tax fraud during the investigation that is limited uh, until the time of filing the indictment with the court. So uh, once the uh, once the indictment is filed with the court, the defendant cannot or well can pay, of course, back, but with not the same legal consequences. It will be regarded as a very uh, strong mitigating uh, factor, but it won't lead to the unlimited reduction of legal consequences, as if he uh, had done it just before filing uh, the indictment. Secondly, and most importantly, the settlement we have, or plea bargain as you like. Now, uh, we'll just tell you a little bit more about this one, but the major and the focus of this whole thing is that the defendant is pleading guilty, uh, and this will result in a sort of pre-agreed legal consequence. This could be penalty, sanction, uh, or measures, whatsoever. However, there are some uh, legal aspects that are falling outside of the scope of the possible uh, agreements. We'll talk about it just in a second. Now, prospecting legal consequences, what the heck is that one? Uh, 
Uh, now that is basically a legalized dialogue between the prosecution service and the defendant. So priorly, we haven't had any possibility to formally speak with the defendant or the defense counsel on how to proceed or maybe how to cooperate with each other. But now we have a legal tool and it is a legalized way of doing this. So basically, this is, a, this is an, an ancillary uh, or, or a preliminary tool for later uh, cooperation that is basically a dialogue. Now, cooperating suspect, that is, mostly would occur in organized crime fashion, uh, criminal proceedings. And this is basically a similar thing to the agreement, but here the contribution is crucial and will result in the termination of procedure or rejecting the complaint. So it's not really a concession, but it moves even further. And this would give you the privilege, if you're the defendant, of terminating the procedure. And But, but the whole idea is very similar. Prosecutorial probation uh, for petty crimes basically available for a certain um, limit or um, a certain gravity of crimes, so not each and every one. And this would, of course, would work if a, a possible positive change is uh, indicated in the future behavior of the defendant. Preliminary session is a new institution provided by the new code on criminal proceedings that uh, entered into scope, temporary scope on the 1st of uh, uh, July, 2018. And this is basically possibly the second in line most important legal institution for cooperation or moving forward the, the uh, evidentiary process. Now, this is also about pleading guilty before the court. And this would, again, uh, result in a reduced uh, legal consequence as maximized in the indictment that is really interesting, hence, before we haven't had this possibility legally to uh, to to envisage or to to uh, write down a sort of a possibility to maximize uh, the penalty or other legal measures for the case or in the case the defendant would plead guilty later on. So this is basically why the agreement is for the investigative stage, preliminary session is for concentrating this kind of evidentiary cooperation or evidentiary-based cooperation in the trial phase. And uh, the last one is, or the last ones are the penalty order and the arraignment. These are just fast-track procedures for, well, simple cases. Uh, in these scenarios, usually we don't need any additional input for the uh, evidentiary process. Now, uh, so focusing on settlement, just to uh, overview the, the most important legal provisions, of course, and again, it's for investigative stage and it's about uh, pleading guilty uh, that would result in a pre-negotiated consequence. Now, there are some negotiable elements and there are ones that cannot be negotiated and cannot be subject to any uh, well, agreement or conversation between the prosecution and the defendant. Negotiable, of course, are the penalties or the legal consequences measures with some, uh, uh, with, with, with just some uh, uh, exceptions. The cost of the panel procedure or the uh, criminal proceedings, and basically it's flexible, so the defendant can undertake any other uh, obligation he wants to that would improve his position to negotiate, like justifying the civil claim or taking part in a mediation, or for example, to give some contribution to the evidential process as well. Now, the non negotiable elements are the facts of the case, the legal classification of the crime, confiscation, hence, this is a compulsory measure uh, and cannot be overruled by an agreement. The civil claim, the well, the civil claim, the basis of the civil claim and the extent cannot be really. Uh, the defendant, of course, can say that, okay, I can uh, partially 
uh, compensate the victim not as a whole because my financial situation would not allow me to do that but so that is negotiable but the legal basis for the civil claim and the extent is not mental treatment is also out of the scope of possible agreement now for the procedure it can be initiated from both uh, the defendant's side or the prosecution uh, of course defense is all, always compulsory hence some uh, serious safeguards are needed uh, because after all this is sort of a, a dialogue and, and entering into an agreement in between the two parties it would be uh, recorded in the minutes and uh, can be uh, applied to all crimes of uh, of the defendant or some individual crimes that means that the defendant can say that he would confess or to uh, to plead guilty just in the part of some uh, crimes that uh, he is suspected with um, the minutes then would be included together with the indictment uh, with a proposal for the court to approve it and this will be done during the preliminary session so just finalize my speech some challenges in a nutshell from practice now we had some really difficult times with uh, suspects earlier on who already pled guilty and then wanted to uh, initiate uh, a negotiation for reaching an agreement so a uh, settlement uh, in other words now this was cleared by the legislation hence the 1st of january this year uh, this is also acceptable if he had already plead guilty so it doesn't really make sense if he wants to plead guilty in the future uh, with, with the intent to initiate a negotiation or he had done uh, uh, before so it wouldn't really make a, a difference now unnecessary statement what is that i mean by that is uh, and this is uh, the key point of the whole settlement uh, thing is that you have to evaluate the evidence uh, coming from the statement of the uh, defendant so pleading guilty is not enough you have to be as a prosecutor you have to evaluate if this statement is really needed to proceed with the uh, criminal proceeding for for the evidentiary uh, purposes you need or not in case it's not needed or it's unnecessary uh, most likely the prosecution will say that i'm sorry but we won't have an agreement here we can uh, support the charges with the evidence already taken uh, third place change in circumstances in some cases it happened that after the agreement uh, the modification of the agreement became necessary and uh, this evoked uh, the interpretation whether it is possible and we gave an answer recently yes it is but only as a consensual uh, legal tool you you also need the consent and again you need the consent of the defendant uh, and that would make uh, the necessity of questioning him again so finally and most possibly the most important part is the compensation versus the settlement that is in other words is it possible to reach uh, an agreement without the compensating the financial damage in tax fraud cases now previously we had this kind of rigid and non-flexible approach by saying that uh, the financial loss should be covered in a whole that means that the defendant should be capable to pay back the whole uh, financial damage caused by a tax fraud and this was based on the uh, compulsory nature of the, com uh, the confiscation rules now we moved on a little bit uh, this year's july and august and now the new approach is a much more flexible view which i believe is can be fruitful in some well uh, in some cases in ex expressively where uh, organized crime uh, will appear uh, because if a defendant would say he's capable and is willing 
to uh, pay back just a part of the financial damage, but in the meantime, he would also contribute to the, the uh, evidentiary needs of the procedure. That's fine. So basically what I'm saying is, even though it's a partial uh, compensation, it should still uh, should be taken into consideration when it comes to whether to reach an agreement or not. And finally, I'm promising these are the final two slides of the presentation. These are the statistics of the settlement, not only in tax crime cases, but as a whole and within the place of the indictments. So the with the with the green one, uh, sorry, not I will start with the yellow. The yellow is for standard indictments. The uh, green one, which is the biggest part of uh, the slide possibly is the penalty order, which is, as I have mentioned earlier on, is the fast track form of filing an indictment. Arraignment comes in third place, and you see that the settlement is just a very, very neat, very narrow part of uh, the cases in which the prosecution filed an indictment. Same goes for the year uh, 2020, so last year. Uh, even, I must say, even a little bit uh, less because previously we had 91 and now we have just uh, 55. Now, obviously, if you ask me what could be a reason, that's a very good question and would worth an examination. But for now and for my very just personal view, I must say that maybe the key factor is because you are reducing the uh, legal consequences, the penalty, and this will take you to responsibility, while responsibility would take you to the very deep uh, evaluation of evidence. So to underline and to summarize for a settlement and for reaching uh, a settlement, you need the prosecution to uh, evaluate all the evidence in details and only then can it uh, uh, render uh, a well-grounded decision whether it is needed or unnecessary. So that is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Uh, I hopefully did not uh, exceed my uh, time frame. So thank you very much again.